हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड वाचिंग वांटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Tonight we start with the Maldives. President Mohammad Morsi is not backing down from his India out pitch. He is expanding it. Reports say his military has seized an Indian fishing boat. Should we see this as a routine maritime brush or is there a political message? Also India's foreign minister has responded to Morsi's bully comment. He says, does a bully give 4 and a half billion dollars in aid? will decode what india's maldives strategy is in germany a major embarrassment for the government their plans for the ukraine war have leaked we'll tell you what the plan says in pakistan a new prime minister has taken charge what are the challenges awaiting shehbaz sharif in india the rape of a brazilian tourist has shocked the nation in the gaza war netanyahu's team appears divided a war cabinet member is on an unapproved foreign visit to the us And today is World Obesity Day. It's a condition that is affecting more than one billion people. We'll tell you what's causing it. All this and more lined up. First, the headlines. Oil prices remain steady a day after OPEC plus cut output. On Sunday, the group led by Saudi Arabia and Russia extended their voluntary output cuts into the second quarter. The move aims to allay market fears amid global economic turmoil. In India opposition launches a personal attack on Prime Minister Modi Lalu Prasad Yadav takes pot shots at the PM for being single Prime Minister Modi responds as the whole country is his family the ruling BJP unveils Modi ka parivar or Prime Minister Modi's family campaign top leaders like Amit Shah and JP Nadda added to their names on X China kicks off its largest political event of the year in Beijing population and property crisis take center stage at the annual meeting Breaking with decades old tradition China's Premier Li Qiang will not hold a press conference the two sessions conclave will last until Sunday Poland wants European Union to sanction food imports from Russia and Belarus this is to counter block wide protests by farmers Polish prime minister refuses to rule out a ban protesting farmers say they are facing unfair competition from non EU nations Germany braces for major travel disruption from Thursday Lufthansa ground staff will be on a two day strike train drivers will also join them Germany is Europe's largest economy in recent months it has been hit by a spate of strikes over pay and better working conditions and the Sudan gets sets condition for African Union's mediation its military leader General Abdel Fattah Al-Burhan wants its membership to be restored after the military coup in October 2021 the AU had suspended Sudan's membership demanding a return to civilian power It's a new week but the same old story in the Maldives more moves against India it's a crisis that refuses to die down first indian soldiers were asked to leave the maldives then the president cozied up to china and now an indian vessel has been seized it's a fishing boat we don't have confirmation from either government on this but here's what local reports say the indian boat was near ha alif kela it's an island in northern maldives just 400 kilometers from the indian state of kerala and why was it seized because the boat was reportedly in fishing inside the maldivian eez now eez is exclusive economic zone think of it as extended territorial waters only you can use the resources inside your eez which is why the indian boat was seized because it was inside the maldivian eez Now we've seen such incidents before there's no line or border on the high seas so fishermen keep crossing over by mistake Just look at India and Sri Lanka in 2023 Colombo arrested 240 Indian fishermen they also seized 35 trawlers so such incidents are not unheard of in fact they're pretty common But this one with the Maldives has more background last month there was a marine standoff Mali accused the Indian coast guard of boarding three Maldivian vessels Again fishing boats they said the boats were inside Maldivian EEZ yet India boarded them so Mali sought an explanation and what did India say nothing in public so my point is this has been brewing for a while chances are it will complicate matters which brings us to the larger question here can India and the Maldives work together again 
New Delhi is doing everything it can, it seems. President Mohammed Muizu wanted Indian soldiers to leave the Maldives. Well, they're leaving. The first batch of civilians has already reached the Maldives. They will soon replace the soldiers. Muizu also decided to visit China before India, which is a snub because Maldivian presidents usually visit India first. This one chose to go to China. Yet India has handled things maturely. No emotional outbursts, no sharp criticism and no big brother attitude. Instead of attacking Mali, India has defended itself, its own track record in the region. Let me take you back to January. President Muizu had just returned from China. He said he wouldn't let anyone bully the Maldives. Now, Muizu did not name any country, but the reference was obvious. Muizu was talking about India. At that point, New Delhi did not say anything. But this week, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar gave a response. The question was, was put to him. And this was the question. Do neighbors perceive India as a bully? Listen to his response. When you say India is perceived as a big bully, you know, big bullies don't provide four and a half billion dollars when the neighbors are in trouble. Big bullies don't supply vaccines uh, to uh, other countries when COVID is on or make exceptions to their own rules to respond to food demands or fuel demands or fertilizer demands because some war in some other part of the world has complicated their lives. Hard to argue with that. You see, diplomatic relations are a lot like human relations. You can't force someone to be your friend. You can't force someone to like you. All you can do is put in the effort, like doing nice things or helping out during crises or being more understanding. The rest is up to the other side. And that's where Muizu is not doing his part. Asking Indian soldiers to leave is one thing, but picking a fight with India is a whole different ball game. Just think about it. Muizu has already gotten what he wanted. The Indian soldiers are heading out. So why poke New Delhi again? Why seize Indian fishing boats? It raises questions about Muizu's long-term strategy. Does he want a working relationship with in India or not? Does he want to be a Chinese ally at India's doorstep? Well, New Delhi is not waiting to find out. This week, a new naval base is being commissioned. It's called INS Jatayu. And where it's located? on Lakshadweep's Minikoy Island, just 100 kilometers from the Maldives. So India is ready for all eventualities to repair and move forward as friends or to live in forever suspicion. It's now President Muizu's turn to make his intentions clear. In Europe, a military leak has caused a political storm. At the receiving end is Germany. It has been hacked. Its blueprint for the Ukraine war has been leaked, and this has put Berlin in a spot. You see, Germany was anyway seen as a reluctant partner. Its role in the war has been questioned throughout in the Ukraine war. And with this leak, its position has become even more difficult. Its allies are raising questions and wondering if Germany can be trusted anymore. So what is this leak? And what does it reveal about Germany? Also, how did these top secret details come out? They leaked because German officials broke some basic rules. They discussed war plans on an unsecured phone line. These were German military officials. They made a grave blunder. And it appears that Russia intercepted this call. It managed to make an audio recording. Over the weekend, Russia today leaked this recording. And now it's being shared on social media. We have a clip. Listen to this. Was zum Beispiel, wie das angebaut ansieht, am Tornado, was kann der Taurus, wie wird er eingesetzt? Aber ja. natürlich spukt er ihm immer noch im Hinterkopf. So what were the Germans discussing? Well, they were talking about arming Ukraine, about the possibility of giving it some powerful missiles like the Taurus. The Taurus is a cruise missile, one of the best that Germany has. The missile is usually fired through a fighter jet. It travels almost at the speed of sound. That's over 1,000 kilometers per hour. It can strike targets some 500 kilometers away. The Taurus can fly low at an altitude of just 35 meters. So it's extremely tough for a radar to catch it. Now, Kiev has been asking for this missile for a long time. But the German chancellor has been reluctant. A weapon which isn't even the most powerful one. A HIMARS rocket launcher achieves a lot more than a Taurus, but which has a 500 kilometer range and which, if used wrongly, can reach a concrete target somewhere in Moscow. He doesn't sound keen to give the Taurus. 
But could that stand change? I ask because Ukraine is increasingly looking more vulnerable, low on weapons and morale. America's latest aid package has been stuck for months and Europe has been trying to step up to fill the gap left by the Americans. So Olaf Scholz may be forced to rethink, and that was the backdrop of this phone conversation, German generals were discussing war scenarios. What if Ukraine had the Taurus missile? Which targets would they hit? And they came up with some ideas. One of the potential targets was the Kerch Bridge. It connects Russia to Crimea. This is what the German generals were discussing on an unsecured phone line. Now that conversation has been leaked and Moscow is up in arms. Today, Russia summoned the German ambassador and registered an official protest. Russia says Germany wants to enter this war and claims that this audio leak is proof. Here we have to find out whether the Bundeswehr is doing this on its own initiative. Then the question is, how controllable is the Bundeswehr? And how much does Scholz control the situation? Or is it part of German government policy of Germany? Both are very bad. Both once again emphasize the direct involvement of the countries of the collective West in the conflict around Ukraine. Russia says Olaf Scholz has lost control of his forces. They're making plans without his knowledge. And Moscow's statement was carefully crafted. It clearly defines the Russian red lines. It tells Berlin that arming Ukraine with long-range missiles would amount to direct intervention in the war. If they give the missiles to Ukraine, it means Germany is entering the war. So what is Germany's response? It's in damage control mode. It accuses Russia of information warfare. What has been reported there is a very serious matter and therefore this will be investigated very carefully, very intensively and very quickly. That's necessary. The incident is clearly more than just the interception and the publication of a conversation within the Air Force. It is part of an information war that Putin is waging. There is no doubt about that. This is a messy situation for Olaf Scholz. He took power in 2021. Since then, he has been on the back foot. Under his leadership, Germany's economy has been pushed towards a recession. His coalition partners are unhappy with him. Differences over policy have led to divisions. Plus, Scholz has been locking horns with Europe, mostly over the military aid to Ukraine. Now, this leak only makes his life more difficult. It shows Germany as the weak link in the Western alliance and Scholz on shaky ground. Russia is capitalizing on this weakness. Pakistan finally has a prime minister. He is a Sharif, but not Nawaz. His younger brother, Shehbaz. Shehbaz Sharif has got the post. That too, without much drama. Pakistan's parliament convened on Sunday to elect the next prime minister. Some 336 lawmakers were eligible to vote. 201 of them voted for Shehbaz Sharif. Only 92 voted for Imran Khan's candidate. So smooth sailing. Earlier today, Shehbaz Sharif was sworn in as the Prime Minister. It's his second stint as Pakistan's leader. The first was from 2022 to 2023. Now, Shehbaz is not the charismatic kind. He was warming the Prime Minister's chair for his elder brother, Nawaz Sharif. But now he finds himself on it again. The question is, what are his plans for Pakistan? His first speech offered some clues. Shabazz Sharif talked about freeing Kashmir. Listen to this. आज एक करारदात पास करें شدید مذمت کی اور کشمیریوں اور فلسطینیوں کی I guess some things never change. Kashmir is an obsession for Pakistan's leaders and Shehbaz Sharif is no different. But his latest statement is not some clarion call. It's the old and dusty army script. So what should India expect from him? At this point, nothing much. Both Shehbaz Sharif and the Pakistani army have a lot on their plate. A nose-diving economy, a rebellious Imran Khan, and homegrown terror groups. So focusing on India will be tough. 
Nawaz Sharif did talk about resetting relations with New Delhi, but that was before the election. A lot has changed since then. The Sharifs have lost a lot of political capital. The army has lost face. So an outreach to India looks very unlikely at this point. Instead, Shehbaz Sharif is focusing on the West. He is promising to repair relations with the US and Europe. America is European Union or Khalij or Khaliji Tawan Council Kesatam Rishte Madbut Karenge. It's clear why Pakistan needs more help from the Western institutions like the IMF or the International Monetary Fund. So he's closing up to the US. Last year, he secured an IMF loan worth $3 billion, but chances are he will need another one. There is talk of a $6 billion IMF bailout. The US and its allies may help Shehbaz Sharif get that money, but even with it, things won't be easy. You see, Pakistan's inflation is almost 24%. They have a lot of bills to pay in the next financial year. How much? Around $25 billion. So ideally, Pakistan needs to implement a lot of reforms, what experts call the bitter pill. But for that, you need to be popular. You have to have a large mandate. Shehbaz and company do not have that. They're being propped up by a reluctant ally, the Pakistan People's Party of the Bhutto Zardaris. So will they risk unpopular reforms or will they stick to the status quo? That's the biggest thing to watch out for. As for India, there's nothing much to do. We are heading into another election soon. Plus, Pakistan is not really priority like before. Earlier, we would see Pakistan feature prominently in Indian campaigns. There was talk of the Pakistan question. But that's not the case anymore. The new focus is on other partners and rivals like the Quad or the G20 or China and Canada. So don't expect India to rush for a reset either. New Delhi will probably observe how things develop across the border, what the new government is up to, what it says and does, and then react accordingly. Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar hinted at this recently. Our problem in the neighborhood, very honestly, is in respect to one country. And, you know, and in diplomacy, you always hold out hopes that, yes, okay, keep at it, and who knows one day, you know, where, what the future holds. Clearly interesting times ahead, also challenging times if you're Shehbaz Sharif. He's known to be the logistics man in Pakistan, an able administrator. But he's hamstrung by multiple challenges, a weak mandate, a lack of popularity, a weakened army, and an immensely popular rival. So his appointment as prime minister is far from a new beginning. It's old wine in an even older bottle. Our next story is about Japan. Last month, the country slipped into recession. Japan fell behind Germany and fell from the third to the fourth spot in the global GDP rankings, meaning Japan is now the fourth largest economy in the world. Germany, which is also on the brink of recession, has taken the third spot. So Japan's economy is shrinking. But Japan's stock markets are soaring. It's quite a contrast. Japan's Nikkei is smashing records. For the first time in its history, the index has crossed the 40,000 mark, 40, 40,000. Their last peak was some 35 years back in 1989. That's when Japan's markets touched a high. Their last all-time high was around 39,000. So it's taken them 35 years to enter a bull run. But why now? What explains this surge when the economy is struggling? Why are the stocks soaring? And three things. One, a rush of foreign investment. Two, better returns for shareholders. And three, a weak yen. That's the Japanese currency. Let's try to understand this through the example of Toyota, the Japanese car maker. Last month, Toyota became Japan's most valued company. Do you know how much Toyota is worth? More than $300 billion. Its stock is in high demand. So the share price has jumped by 15% this year. And who's buying these Toyota shares? Mostly foreign investors. The company has been posting good numbers. It expects a solid jump in profits, a jump of some 65%. Also, sales have jumped. Toyota is in expansion mode. It is investing in emerging markets and in emerging technologies like electric vehicles. 
Last year, Japan's currency, the yen, fell. It slipped to a multi-decade low, and a recovery is nowhere in sight. And Toyota has benefited from this, because exporting cars has become cheaper. And this is not a unique case. Toyota is not the only company that has benefited. The entire stock market in Japan has made gains. Foreign investors are pouring in big money. In January, they invested $14 billion into Japanese stocks. Japanese companies are reporting strong results. Their earnings rose by 45% in the last three months of 2023. Plus, marquee investors are turning to Japan. I'm talking about the likes of Warren, Warren Buffett. His company is buying more Japanese stocks. In 2020, he invested around $6 billion in Japan. Today, that number touched $17 billion, from $6 to $17 billion in four years. These are large investments, and they look set to continue. And it's not just Japanese companies that want to make the most of it. Japan's prime minister is also trying to ride this bull run. It is encouraging to see the market's positive response to our efforts and the transformation of the Japanese economy. This year is a critical time for this trend to take root. The government is committed to achieving a virtuous cycle that includes structural wage increases. So the soaring stock markets make for good headlines. But a strong stock market does not necessarily mean a strong economy. And Japan is the best example to understand that. Stock markets run on sentiment, on company results, on profits. And while investors and businesses are getting rich, the people of Japan are not. Inflation has been high and savings are going down. The household savings rate has turned negative in Japan. Factories in the country are also producing fewer goods because people are buying less. Four days back, Tokyo released the, released the latest numbers. Japan's factory output fell at its fastest pace in nearly four years. Japan also has the world's oldest population. This has serious repercussions on the economy. An aging population strains a country's finances. It shrinks the tax base and increases the expenses. At this rate, Japan will spend more on health care and pensions. So stocks are going up, the economy is shrinking, the prime minister needs to intervene. He has a narrow window of opportunity to reverse Japan's decline and revive its economy. He must act now without the right moves. The bull run in the Japanese market will be reduced to just a bubble. On Friday, a foreign tourist in India put up a video on Instagram. She was talking about her travels in India and her... She had bruises on her face. She had been gang raped by seven men during her trip. This incident happened in the state of Jharkhand. Her husband, who was with her, was beaten up badly. The story led to a lot of outrage and condemnation. The authorities swung into action. Three of the accused have been caught. Four others are on the run. Now, this is not the first such incident in the country. Chances are it won't be the last. Every 18 minutes, a woman is raped in India. This is data from the government of India. And this incident has sparked a fierce debate on social media about women's safety and women tourists. Our next report has more. Five years, 63 countries, 170,000 kilometers. This couple began their world tour half a decade ago. They boarded their bikes and never looked back. But their journey took a horrible turn last week. The woman and her husband were on a biking trip in India. They were travelling from West Bengal to Nepal. On their way, they stopped in Jharkhand. It was around 5pm, so they decided to spend the night there. They set up a temporary camp and were preparing to go to bed. That's when seven men entered their tent. They beat the couple, they robbed them, they raped the woman and threatened to kill the duo. At around 11 p.m., the couple flagged down a patrol van. The patrolling team couldn't understand what they said, but they looked visibly injured. So the van took them for treatment. That's when the couple told the doctors about the rape, prompting the police to jump into action. Three of those men have been arrested and four are still on the run. The woman is a dual national. The Brazilian embassy was informed and so was the Spanish embassy as the couple used Spanish passports to enter India. Over the weekend, the 28-year-old took to social media. She put up a video on her Instagram page. It was in Spanish. She talked about her ordeal. She showed the bruises on her face and how glad she was to be alive. 
her husband posted a similar video. The videos are not on their page anymore, but it sparked a fierce debate. Is India safe for women tourists? Over the weekend, Indians and foreigners shared their stories. They all had one thing in common, how they faced sexual harassment or have been a witness to it. One such post got a response from the chief of India's National Commission for Women. Rekha Sharma commented on the post. She questioned why the person didn't report it and asked them to not defame the whole country. But was the tweet defaming India? Or are these heinous incidents doing that? In 2023, a Korean vlogger was sexually harassed in Rajasthan. That same year, a Dutch tourist was molested and stabbed in Goa. In 2018, a British tourist was raped in Goa too. In 2016, an American woman alleged she was gang-raped in a hotel in the national capital. In 2013, a Swiss tourist was gang-raped by six men. They were later sentenced to life in prison. And it's not just foreign tourists. Indian women have faced the brunt as well. Every day, an average of 90 rapes are recorded. In 2013, the country amended its rape law. It broadened the definition. It brought in new punishments for sexual assault and stalking. Yet, it hasn't changed much on the ground. This latest incident could lead to more policing, more awareness, stronger condemnation and more conversation both on social media and off it. But the fact of the matter is, every 18 minutes, a woman is raped in India. We will need much more than conversation and half-baked measures to deal with the issue. This weekend, Gaza witnessed some unprecedented scenes. Three US planes flew over the Strip. Once they were close to the coastline, they airdropped bundles. Take a look at this. That was food and aid for the Gaza Strip, a total of 38,000 meals. Hardly enough for a million starving people. But it's a first for America. For the first time in about five months, the U.S. is dropping aid into the Gaza Strip. President Joe Biden says it will be the first of many. But why now? Why after five months? It's because the sentiment is shifting. The Gaza war began on October 7th. It's been 150 days. 30,000 people have been killed. That's one out of every 75 people. Over 8,000 are missing. And Israel's strikes show no signs of ending. On Thursday, 112 people were killed. Why? Because they rushed towards an aid convoy. Israel says it was a stampede. That's how they died. Eyewitnesses say Israeli forces fired at these people. It's hard to establish the truth, but one thing is evident. This war cannot go on for much longer like this. Gaza is on the verge of famine, and if the world does not intervene, its people will starve to death. The Israeli government must do more to significantly increase the flow of aid. No excuses. They must open new border crossings. They must not impose any unnecessary restrictions on the delivery of aid. They must ensure humanitarian personnel, sites and convoys are not targeted. And they must work to restore basic services and promote order in Gaza so more food, water and fuel can reach those in need. Israel has no excuses. That's what the U.S. Vice President says. It's a rare rebuke. Israel, after all, is America's closest ally. They have supported them for five months. But now, the Americans do not sound so enthusiastic. It's an election year in the U.S., after all, and the Democrats are losing support over this war. It's a big price to pay for an ally. Plus, their Western partners are calling for a ceasefire. Hence, the changing tone in Washington. Kamala Harris will also have a meeting today with Benny Gantz. A senior member of the Israeli War Cabinet, he's also Benjamin Netanyahu's main political rival. Polls suggest if elections were to be held today in Israel, Benny Gantz would win, not Netanyahu. 
he would beat Netanyahu. And right now, he's in Washington, meeting the top leadership. The White House says it is a routine visit, but Israeli media says it happened without Netanyahu's permission. So chances are, it's a signal. It's a sign to Netanyahu to slow down the military campaign. And it's not the only thing that the U.S. is doing at the moment. This weekend, they tried to mediate a peace deal. The talks were held in Cairo. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of backdoor diplomacy, but the goal was simple, a pause in fighting. And who attended these talks? The Hamas was there, so was the U.S. A Qatari delegation was mediating, but the Israeli side was missing. Do you know why? Because they wanted some assurances from Hamas, assurances that they did not get. I'll tell you about that in a bit. But first, let's look at the peace deal. What do they want to achieve? The framework is quite simple. A six-week pause in fighting, the release of Israeli hostages, the exchange of Palestinian prisoners, and aid moving into Gaza. But will they be able to strike this deal? On Saturday, U.S. reports suggested that Israel had nearly accepted it. The source was an unnamed official. They said the ball was now in Hamas's court. On Sunday, they were supposed to meet in Cairo, but Israel did not show up on Sunday. It wanted an assurance about the fate of hostages. It wanted to know how many hostages are alive. Hamas could not offer that assurance, so the Israeli delegation backed out. Hamas, on the other hand, has set its own conditions, three of them. One, a permanent ceasefire. Two, withdrawal of Israeli troops. And three, the return of Gaza citizens to the north. Of course, Israel does not agree with much of it, which explains the meeting in Cairo. Any flexibility that we show in the negotiation is out of concern for the blood of our people and to put an end to their big pains and the sacrifices. But this comes in parallel with full readiness to defend our people. Any threats of committing new massacres in Rafah reaffirms the nature of the enemy and its criminal army. So does that mean that the ceasefire deal is dead? Well, not yet. Negotiations are still on. Regional powers are at it. The plan is to secure a truce by Ramadan, which is a holy month for Muslims. It starts next week. Will it bring peace to Gaza? I guess we'll find out soon enough. Back to India and a unique act of diplomatic outreach. The Indian subcontinent is the birthplace of four major religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism and Buddhism. While three of them have their strongholds at home in India, one is revered in almost every corner of Asia. We're talking about Buddhism. It ties India with most Asian nations like Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. It links the people together spiritually and the government of India knows this, which is why it has been championing Buddhist outreach. Indian relics of the Buddha are currently in Thailand. They reached the city of Chiang Mai today. It's part of a 26-day tour of Thailand and the Thai people have been gathering in the thousands to pay their respects. Here's our report. Buddhism is a religion based on the teachings of the Buddha. Siddhartha Gautama was once a prince, but he renounced his kingdom and became a philosopher. His life was spent in India, spreading wisdom. He attained enlightenment in what is today Bodh Gaya, becoming the Buddha. He also left earth in the cycle of death and rebirth behind in India, in Kushinagar in present-day Uttar Pradesh. When he died, his body didn't disappear completely. There are parts of him still on earth bone fragments that survived cremation. And a few have been discovered by archaeologists over time. Today, we call these bone fragments of the Buddha relics. India has 20 of them, and they are sacred to Buddhists everywhere, which is why India has been championing a diplomatic initiative. It is loaning out these relics to Buddhist nations so that their devotees can have a chance to pay their respects. Four of India's 20 Buddha relics are in Thailand, to the great joy of thousands of Buddhists there. The relics arrived in Thailand's capital, Bangkok, last month, on the 22nd of February. They were received by Thailand's Prime Minister, Shreta Thavisan. The relics were then put on display in a special pavilion, on the royal grounds next to the Bangkok Palace. Hundreds of thousands of devotees have been flocking there since, to pay their respects. 
The Bangkok leg of the journey concluded yesterday. A crowd of almost 150,000 made their way to the pavilion to catch the last glimpse in Bangkok. The relics are still in Thailand, but they have been moved to Chiang Mai. They arrived there today, receiving a grand welcome. They will be on display in Chiang Mai till the 8th. After that, they will go to Ubon Rachatani and then Krabi. They will return to India on the 19th of March, concluding an almost month-long tour. This outreach isn't just for Thai Buddhists. People from nearby nations like Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam have also been invited to see the relics. It is an initiative that brings the people of the region together and forges a greater bond with India. That's why these delicate relics are being sent to various Buddhist nations. Last year, they were sent to Mongolia. Before that, they have toured Sri Lanka, South Korea and Singapore as well. Every time, they have drawn sizable crowds. The Buddhist outreach is both diplomatically and economically advantageous. Aside from forging closer people-to-people -people ties, it also reminds people of Buddhism's intrinsic ties to India. The Indian contingent travelling with the relics has also been setting up exhibits, showcasing the different pilgrimage sites. Three of the four major Buddhist sites are in India. Bodhgaya, where the Buddha attained enlightenment, is already a major draw. Kushinagar, where he passed away, is also a pilgrimage site. Then there is Sarnath, where he delivered his first sermon. All these sites are in India. The Relic Outreach Programme is a reminder of this. This way, the Buddhist ties may turn out to be a boost for tourism, and India's rich heritage may benefit people from around the world. We know that the AI age has started. Well, so has the age of regulating it. And guess who's starting things off? India. The Indian government has issued an advisory for AI companies. We haven't seen the exact details, but two things stand out. Number one, you need permission to roll out beta models. These are products still under development. Suppose you're making an AI platform, something like ChatGPT. Earlier, you could just release it on the internet. People could access it, use it, and point out your mistakes. But the government says, not anymore. It wants tech firms to take permission first. Not for all AI models, though. This rule is largely for for large AI models. If you are an artificial intelligence startup, it doesn't apply to you. Now the second thing, labeling. Artificial intelligence models must carry disclaimers. We know that they can be unreliable and inaccurate, so the government wants these companies to say that. Like the warning labels on cigarette boxes. Now why is this advisory important? A, because it's a global first, the first country in the world to do this. Most countries agree that we need to regulate AI, but they don't know how to do it. So India has gone ahead and done it. And B, because it will have far-reaching implications on the AI landscape. Because most companies hate regulation. They think it slows down innovation. So the fear is, what if the same happens to India's AI industry? What if the rules scare away investors? What if it discourages talent? These are all genuine worries among industry leaders, so let's try and address them tonight. For starters, these are not rules yet. This is still an advisory by the Information Technology Ministry, meaning it's not legally binding, not yet. But for how much longer, we don't know. Usually, advisories tell you what a government is planning. If it's a suggestion today, it could be a rule tomorrow. Secondly, this is not about throttling artificial intelligence. It's about making it safer. Let me quote what the IT minister is saying. Public internet should not be conflated with a sandbox insofar as unlawful content is concerned. India's ambitions in AI and ensuring internet users get a safe and trusted internet are not binaries. That's what the minister said. What does it mean? You can have innovation and safety. You don't have to choose between them. Let me explain. India's IT rules apply to firms developing artificial intelligence models. And what do the rules say? You can't show content that can cause harm, that can trigger violence, or worse. If you do, you can be sued. We saw an example recently.
Google's AI model said Prime Minister Modi's policies were fascist. Clearly, it was false and triggering. The IT minister said it was a violation of India's IT rules. So technically, Google could have been sued. But this puts AI firms in a tough spot. Their models have to be tested in the real world. But if those models make errors, the company can be sued. So the government is suggesting a middle ground. Take our permission, label your models as possibly unreliable, then roll them out. But like I said, experts are still worried. The CEO of Abacus AI says, and I'm quoting, India just kissed its future goodbye. The creator of private LLM says this, what a way to put the brakes on AI in India, a sad day for progress. Are these concerns genuine? I'm afraid there isn't a yes or no answer. There is no question that regulation is needed. It is. AI cannot be the Wild West. So you had to start somewhere. In that sense, the advisory is a good start. It shows that the government is thinking about the problem. The only worry is, has it gone too far? We'll have to observe how this advisory is implemented, how the permissions are given, and also how the tech companies and investors respond to this move not on social media, but in reality. That will give us the full picture. But I will say this, in such issues, clarity always helps. You want the message to be crystal clear. In this case, it was not clear. When the news broke, the tech industry went into meltdown. They did not know what this advisory meant or how it would affect them. So the IT minister had to issue clarifications. He posted two separate messages on social media. Maybe that confusion could have been avoided. Having said that, let's not villainize regulation. I know it's a bad word in the free market dictionary, but it also keeps the internet safe. Our next story is from Haiti. The Caribbean island nation is in chaos. For days, Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, has been under attack. A gang leader called Barbecue is cooking up a storm there. He has directed various gangs to attack the government, Haiti's international airport, and even jails. Yesterday, two prisons were besieged. The guards eventually fled, and about 4,000 inmates were let loose. Haiti's government has declared a state of emergency. They're trying to bring order back to Port-au-Prince. But the gangs they face control about 80% of the capital. Our next report has the details. The entire law and order mechanism seems to have broken down in Haiti. The country looks to be in the middle of a coup, a coup led by armed gangs. They say they want one thing, the ouster of Prime Minister Oriel Henry. We are demanding that the police and the military take responsibility and arrest Ariel Henry. Men with weapons are not your enemy. Arrest Ariel Henry and you will see how these weapons are not to cause any harm. They are the symbol of our freedom. That was gang leader Jimmy Cherizier, who also goes by the name Barbecue. He was once an elite police officer, and now he's become a spokesperson for the gangs of Haiti. The gangs seem to have come together. They're coordinating their attacks on the capital, Port-au-Prince. They've been besieging police stations, targeting Haiti's international airport. And yesterday, they conducted their boldest attack yet. They attacked two prisons and set the inmates free. One prison was in the capital, the National Penitentiary. The other jail was on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince. Combined, the prisons held about 5,000 prisoners. Most of them are now free. The attack on the National Penitentiary left some prisoners dead and many injured. Oh, a lot of shooting, a lot of people died, a lot of deaths around the prison, all around the prison. I received a bullet here and another a little higher up. I was hit yesterday at 9 p.m. I'm suffering. About 100 chose to stay behind in the prison, but almost 4,000 escaped from this national penitentiary. It prompted the Haitian government to declare a state of emergency yesterday. The emergency will last till Tuesday. There's a curfew in place. The police are trying to bring back some order. They've reached out to the Haitian military for help but the situation remains precarious. 
Now, you may wonder, what has led to this state of affairs? Why do the gangs want to get rid of Henri? Ariel Henri is both the Prime Minister and Acting President of Haiti. The problem is, he was unelected. He was appointed Prime Minister by the former President, Jovenel Moïse. Moïse was assassinated two days after this appointment. Henri was supposed to hold elections, but he's been delaying them. And this is the justification the gangs are using for their violence. There's also another reason why the gangs are acting up. Last Thursday, Henri went to Kenya. He signed a deal with Kenyan President William Ruto. It will allow Kenya to send police officers to Haiti as the head of a multinational force. This force has been tasked by the UN to bring order to Haiti. And of course, this will affect the gangs. These gangs have overrun Port-au-Prince. They control 80% of the Haitian capital. The Kenya-led force will push back against them. To avoid this, the gangs are unleashing their fury. They hope to prevent Henri from bringing back law and order. Now it seems to have become a race between the Haitian PM and these gangs to see who can oust the other first. In 1733, Benjamin Franklin visited Boston. He observed the city's fire preservation methods, and he was impressed. So two years later, he wrote about it. He said, an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so the famous adage was born. But over time, it has changed in two ways. One, it is less verbose. We say, prevention is better than cure. And two, it doesn't just reference fires. The quote is usually about health. It talks about disease prevention. And it may be cliched, but today we urge you to think about it. Because today is World Obesity Day. Despite the intensifying fight against obesity, the disease is hurting more people than ever before. Between 1990 and 2022, the obesity rate has doubled in women, tripled in men, and quadrupled among children. Now more than a billion people the world over are living with obesity. More than 1 billion. This includes almost 880 million adults and 159 million children. So the picture is quite clear. We are struggling with a global obesity crisis. And this is not just about one disease. Obesity is not just about excessive fat accumulation. It impacts most body systems. It leads to a range of other problems like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, strokes, even cancer. But despite all the science, we don't have a surefire cure for obesity. Though many say they've found a ray of hope in weight loss drugs. Their advent is being heralded as momentous. Obesity drugs are all the rage. They become household names like Novo Nordisk's Vigavi or Ellie Lilly Zebbound. Obesity drugs are expected to have 70 million users by 2028. 70, 70 million users and a market worth $80 billion by 2030. But let's take a step back and ask an important question here. Are weight loss drugs really the solution? Or are they more noise and less substance? Recently, the World Health Organization weighed in. It said these drugs are an important tool, but they're not the solution to obesity. And here's why. For starters, weight loss drugs are not a long-term solution. Many users gain the weight back when they stop taking these drugs. And when they do take these drugs, other issues crop up like stomach paralysis, inflamed pancreas, bowel obstructions, kidney problems, increased heart rate, suicidal thoughts, Changes in vision, nausea, diarrhea, fatigue. So there's a heavy price to pay. And speaking of price, weight loss drugs are also fueling inequality. You see, obesity is a complex disease. It affects people across nations. But ultimately, it hurts mostly the poor. It hurts them more. Let me show you some numbers. You know that global numbers for obesity are on the rise. But did you know that they have leveled off in some big economies, like in India? It is the 19th lowest country for obesity among women and 21st lowest for men. Similarly, China is 11th lowest for women. And these are outliers, of course. For example, the US has the 10th highest obesity rate for men. But in general, obesity has seen a decline in some rich nations and a rapid increase in poorer countries. 
the low and middle income nations. The highest rates of obesity are in Tonga, American Samoa, and Nauru. In these countries, 70 to 80 percent of adults live with obesity. In the coming years, the greatest increases will be in low income African and Asian nations. So the trajectory is quite clear. The poor are already vulnerable. Now, weight loss drugs are making it worse. In countries where obesity drugs are not available, people are buying them from online black markets and putting their health at risk. And where the drugs are available, many cannot afford them. One month supply of these drugs costs anywhere between $900 and $1,500. So people are looking for alternatives, like budget ozempic. Ozempic is used to treat type 2 diabetes. It is also used as a weight loss drug. But budget ozempic is not actually ozempic at all. It refers to laxatives. It is an unhealthy solution to an unhealthy problem. So weight loss drugs can be effective, at least in the short term. They can reduce weight and show immediate results. But so far, drugs have not been able to cure obesity because they're only playing catch up. So how do we battle obesity? With policy changes right from the top, physical activity in schools, and restrictions on marketing for junk food. Because when it comes to obesity, unless weight loss drugs transform into magic pills, prevention will always be better than cure. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Wales, a shimmering curtain of northern lights lit up the, north, the night sky. In South Korea, crowds bid farewell to a giant panda before her return to China. And Hanoi becomes the world's most polluted city as smog blankets the streets. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day. In 1789, the U.S. Constitution went into effect. It became the governing law of the country. The Constitution was written in Philadelphia by delegates representing 12 states. It is one of the oldest constitutions in the world. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.